Hello and welcome on The Barricades. My name is Bojan Stanislavski and I will be your host today. And my guest and your special guest is Nebojša Malic. Uh, welcome to the show, Nebojša, and thanks for taking time to come on our show. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Right. So for those uh, out there who might not have encountered uh, any of your work yet, uh, you are an American Serbian journalist and also a political analyst and commentator. Uh, you frequently write for the RT website and other media outlets. Uh, so uh, thank you once again for coming on because uh, we do want to delve into the situation in Serbia today and, uh, you know, this kind of post non maidan serbia maybe i don't know what's your take on that because you see uh, we had this funny events and i say funny because i feel this was something like a clumsily organized uh, kind of like maidan attempt to take down vucic uh, in serbia last year and uh, first my first question is do you agree that we're talking here about a clumsily organized clumsy attempt to to stage a colored revolution uh, in belgrade well, I think so. Um, let me just add that you know, I've I've spent uh, over a decade covering uh, Balkans affairs, including Serbia for antiwar.com before I uh, uh, started working for RT America. So um, I've, I've got a little bit of experience with right. um, local politics here I'm in Belgrade, but also um, the original my my engagement with antiwar.com started after the original Serbian Maidan or the proto Maidan that was actually. The, the, the progenitor of subsequent color revolutions um, in Ukraine twice and then in Georgia and elsewhere, uh, which was in October 2000. Right. The and successful Maidan at the time, right? Yeah. Right. And then, so keeping with the maxim that history repeats itself in the second time is a farce, you could, you could look at um, last year's um, sort of a, you know, daily evening scheduled riots at the right. outside of Belgrade yeah. City Hall as, as a farce in this case. Um, there, there, there definitely was a very clumsy attempt to take down the government, um, but I think it was mostly intended to raise the propaganda profile of, of the organizers in the West and justify their funding uh, more than anything else, uh, because I don't think they actually had a, uh, had a hope of, of overthrowing Vucic. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, your thesis is that they they knew that they're not going to be able to take down Vucic actually, but they thought that they should test out the ground and see how far they can go and what they can achieve and how the public is going to react. What kind of uh, attention are they going to be getting from the international media and I don't know some celebrities, political celebrities, if you like. Is is that is my reading correct of what you said? Yeah, I mean, basically, it was one of those, if it works, it works. If it, if it doesn't work, it's good PR for us. There is mm -hmm. no such thing as bad PR. Uh, it, that That's my uh, sense. Well, but but you know, it's, it's a little bit disputable, I would say, because there was a lot of bad PR in the sense that they took, for example, some second secondhand uh, sort of recycled, uh, refurbished figures from, uh, you know, the... Uh, the, the dungeons of Twitter, for example, or X, as it is called now, and and they got like people like Gunter Ferlinger to cheer for this Maidan in Serbia, which is like, I mean, you really could have picked someone else, someone with a little bit more, you know, mental stability, plus a little bit more of an influence, actual influence on the public. And then, you know, when I look in Poland, for example, we have this funny institutes for uh, investigating Eastern affairs, East politics, and so on and so forth. And they are really funny because there are no experts there at all. I mean, all, all those people are ideal ideologically obsessed with, you know, taking down Russia, taking down Serbia, taking down anything that's not dominated by, uh, you know, euro atlantis tendencies. So, uh, and then, you know, we get like one of the funniest and one of the most pathetic people from this Polish, you know, circles to also cheer for this Maidan. And I thought like, you know, looking at the comments even on X or other platforms where they were posting, the comments were profoundly critical and kind of, you know, mocking those people. So th th that's why I'm saying I don't think the PR was so great, really, when it comes to the... Right. Well, that's the thing. The PR on social media, especially on X, which is one of, you know, currently the least censored mm. uh, social network out there, were obviously negative. But in the controlled media, like this, you know, United Media Network based oh, out yeah. of Luxembourg that, that dominates, um, that basically dominates... Uh, uh, one half of Serbian media space, mm -hmm. it was all very, very serious, very supportive. This, you know, thank you, my friends, you are democracy and justice type of stuff. And this is the audience that they're playing to. And it's, you know, members of European Parliament. It's it's the Germans, mostly poli yeah. German politicians. 
that they're sucking up to something pay more give us more right it's, it's always always yeah. that's that is the first and that's the prime motivation of these people yeah same as in bulgaria by the way i mean things on the balkans they seem to happen pretty much the same way only uh okay so let's uh let's talk a little bit now about uh vucic because uh that was something that he seems to have anticipated like him his government anna barnabich also said that you know they were receiving information from russia or from other intelligence sources abroad that there is this kind of coup or semi-coup being organized Organized and uh, clearly they were kind of prepared for it with the police being you know placed inside the buildings around which the riots were organized and so on and so forth but uh, I wonder uh, how 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 tolerant is Vucic and the current uh, Serbian administration towards this kind of events because you know if you the history teaches us that right especially in the Balkans like when you look at what's been happening in 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 Belgrade in the year 2000 uh, what's been happening in Sofia and major cities throughout Bulgaria in 1996-1997 again you know I would argue the first successful college revolution after 1989 so you know when you look at it you see clearly that the more tolerance is demonstrated by the administration, by the central government for this kind of tendencies, the more it is treated as a potential weakness on the part of the government and the more aggressive those people become, the more aggressive those organizations, so-called civil society, I hate this phrase, by the way, uh, and, and, you know, they become aggressive. And I wonder, like, is Vucic prepared to actually at one point, maybe uh, not necessarily kind of repress them massively, but to kind of give them a clear sign that, guys, this is the further, furthest, sorry, you can go. Well, my my feeling about Vucic's policy is that he's <clears throat> happy to give these people rope to hang themselves with. Mm -hmm. um, there was a you know a couple of years ago, um, Milos Bikovic, the uh, actor who's famous in both Serbia and Russia and sort of hated in Ukraine now for that reason, he gave an interview to this Russian liberal journalist and she asked him if there's censorship in Serbia and he said not enough. Mm -hmm. And he had a very, very colorful example to illustrate this, but it's been an ongoing problem. And again, this is kind of ironic. You know, I'm, I'm in Serbia now and I'm advocating for more censorship. Um, I'm, I'm not on principle. I hate censorship. Um, and uh, in, in some respects, uh, I have to clarify this. I, I, I oppose censorship on principle. Uh, but Serbia has laws to pro criminally prosecute people who do things like, you know, um, spread ethnic or religious hatred. Mm -hmm. And they've they've been used against um, more pro-nationalist uh, activists over the years. Meanwhile, all of these rabidly pro-EU people are going as far as to wish genocide upon the Serbs and they're on the state payroll, like in universities and in public media. And then when you criticize them, they shriek that they are being victimized and persecuted. And, you know, EU help, please, freedom of speech. It's, it's pure cynicism. You know, I mean, if I say something that's objectionable, you know, by all means, please criticize me for it. But these people are would like to have their cake and eat it too. They, they want to spend their entire day at being paid by the government to defecate all over this country and its people and you know, advocate for its dismemberment and destruction. And when somebody criticizes them, they, they play the victim. And so, you know, this is, this is one of the problems. I would, I would argue Vucic is far too tolerant of, mm -hmm. of not just the so-called civil society and NGOs, but of people who openly call for this country's destruction. And yet cracking down on them isn't necessarily practical. And he's he's basically decided to let them speak and beclown themselves on a daily basis, mm -hmm. hoping that, you know, that would demonstrate to the electorate that that, you know, they're worthless and terrible and um, not worth electing instead of him. And so far, this strategy has worked for him remarkably. He's been in power for 12 years and you know, every time these guys make a huge fuss and a huge production, oh, the, he's done, he's done for, he's he's going down, we're, we're going to triumph, and they fall flat on their face every time. So from his perspective, this seems to be working. From the perspective of the people who have to put up with their crap, pardon my French, mm -hmm. Day in and day out, it's it's frankly unbearable. Okay, but uh, tell me a little bit about those groups who call, uh, because I understand it's not just a rhetorical figure here, but there are actually people who are calling for the dismemberment of the Serbian state. Who, oh, like, absolutely, yeah, and, and, absolutely. I mean, 
Well, you st there, there's people, you know, there's folks who who um, in the middle of you know, in in the middle of Belgrade insist that you know Kosovo, for example, is a sovereign independent state that Serbia needs to recognize, mm -hmm. which is literally treason. Yeah. Um, there, you know. Sure. It's, it's against the Serbian constitution, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, this this position should be at, at the very least controversial. But mm -hmm. you know, these people keep keep arguing it. Um, you have, um, I mean, you have people advocating for, you know, separating this northern province called Vojvodina, which is mm -hmm. a relic of, of communism and, and it doesn't need to exist at all, um, in my opinion and opinion of many others. But, you know, once you have a bureaucracy, it's self-sustaining and self-perpetuating. And so it's, it's carrying on. And again, at government expense, people's expense. And in the, there's, there are people who literally want it to separate and have been arguing now admittedly they're polling in single digits but they have a disproportionately loud voice because they have media access yeah and they have financing and you know support of the eu and so on right exactly and so they use this financing and external support to sow discord and advocate for literally dismemberment of their country which again is in as far as i understand serbian law it's a criminal offense but they don't get prosecuted or so much as hassled mm -hmm. Okay, and why is that? Because Vucic has this clever strategy or because Vucic is afraid that they're going to come, come at him if he actually attempts to, to restrain those, those tendencies? I mean, it's, it's possible that it's a little from column A, a little from column B. He, he doesn't want to necessarily annoy the EU and the West too much because he's doing this delicate balancing act. Um, the, the one phrase that he used, that it's better to be at the table than you know, on the table, as in being served, um, yeah, yeah, I get that, but I, I, I'm kind of doubtful about this strategy. And of course, you know, I'm not I'm not an expert in Serbian um, po politics or, or Serbian internal matters or Serbian, you know, the processes that take place in Serbia right now. But it's just very kind of worrisome when you see a leader that's facing an obvious uh, attempt to, you know, organize against, well, against him, against his government and against like democratically like the government after all, right? And uh, yeah. someone who does have support of the people and so on and so forth. And that's been demonstrated election after election after election for the last 12 years, as you said, uh, including the early elections last year. So, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a kind of a strategy, which is, of course, I mean, you can argue in favor of that strategy, but it always it's always very worrisome when you give them, you know, when you give them enough room, because they will always use every millimeter of it to undermine your position. And in the final aftermath you know when they have a chance they'll just stick a, a you know a fork into your into your yeah. forehead or, or your back or something well i mean i mean as as you know as the americans say give them an inch and they'll take a mile yeah, right. um i mean yeah and i've been on the record criticizing vucic for mm -hmm. for this strategy because i think it's um sort of alien to the serbian national character this mm -hmm. sort of compromising you know wishy-washying you know we, we are small and we must submit uh, type thing that's that's really just alien to our national character and I've repeatedly said this um, but I, again it seems to be working for him and he seems to be you know determined to maintain it right um so you know so maybe he knows he's better like right <laughs> he's in politics I'm not so you know I, I, his mileage may vary but um, by the same token you know if I were in his place the which I'm not um, I would probably use at least a little bit of lawfare against people who are who think they can get away with everything just to send them a message that they no mm -hmm. they can't. Yeah, but also, how is the Serbian public reacting to this uh, to these notions that are offered from what from what you you know just described to se uh, to separate Vojvodina from <laughs> proper Serbia and to you know recognize Kosovo and so on and so forth? Because in Bulgaria, to compare to make a comparison between the two neighboring countries, which are different but still, I mean, there are elements and, and, and spheres where we can make uh, comparisons. Then, then, when it comes to to this crowd. Uh, this crowd of people who just, you know, blindly follow the West and think like Bulgaria and Serbia and everybody has to be like the West because deep down inside, like everybody in Serbia and in Bulgaria and in Greece is like, they, they want to be like the Americans, like the Germans or like the French. So we have a small crowd of people like that and they don't necessarily call for, you know, splitting up Bulgaria or anything like that. But they, they what they practice is the, this kind of active self-hatred of their own culture, nation and everything.
everything, which is pathetic. You know, I've never been like politically speaking, never positioned myself in the kind of patriotic circles or things like that. I've always been on the kind of socialistic side. But the, the thing is that, you know, now when I'm looking at it, I just become patriot myself because I just want to defend the Bulgarian nation against it. I mean, what are you, how can you just, you know, speak to people like this, that they are worthless, that they are, you know, um, they are only worth to be loathed and, you know, despised and so on and so forth because they, I don't know, because they, 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 they don't accept certain elements of the ideology, dominating ideologies in the West. So we have this, we have this, and this is a very, very small group and it doesn't have any support in the society, but because the, the, the West, you know, the collective West, as the Russians like to refer to it now, has put all their eggs in that particular basket in Bulgaria, they keep prevailing. And I wonder whether, you know, uh, you know, people in Serbia or yourself, maybe as a political analyst, can, can see that happening in Serbia as well. Like, you know, you will have a small group, no basis in society, but because of the Western support, they are able to, to, to somehow prevail. And, you know, Serbia has been, has somehow managed to, to defend itself, right? I mean, after the 2000 uh, and the successful Maidan at that time, they were able to get to a point where Vucic is who he is and, and he's leading the country kind of balancing between Russia uh, and the EU. But, uh, you know, that's undoubtedly the plan, the Western plan for Serbia, this to become. Do you think that, you know, with this politics, with this administration of Vucic, do you think that, you know, this model, Vucic's model is sustainable? And do you see that it can, it can develop and maybe mobilize people against these kind of trends? Well, so the, I don't know whether it was Vucic who mobilized people against mm -hmm. this kind of sentiment, but it was literally these people's agitation campaign, you know, in the media. Every time one of them goes on one of these pro-Western networks or, you know, in one of these pro-Western newspapers with a, with a tiny circulation that seemed to be given relevance by their sort of, they have this sort of circular, circular reporting ring of where one outlets quotes the other which quotes the other yeah. and they sort of you know let let me just keep it there so i i remain polite I, there's there's other expressions i could use um but they seem to be relevant in that you know to themselves but every time they do this the general public reacts with revulsion mm -hmm. and the more they spit on serbia the more people the more pe uh, patriotic the people here get and so it's, but it's, that might be one of the reasons why Vucic is letting them do this. Um, because again, he has legal avenues to stop this, but he's choosing not to use them. Because again, fr from his perspective, they're actually fueling patriotic resistance. The more they talk, the more patriotic, especially the younger generations get. Mm -hmm. Now, l going back of a few years, um, for the first 12 years of the century, Serbia was actually ruled by the most fanatical, let's call them liberal Democrats, because right. they, that's what they call themselves, who literally carried out the EU's every whim and the US's every whim, violating the constitution left and right, you know, destroying Yugoslavia, which was then still a country, um, you know, practically handing over Kosovo, like uh, never forget that uh, the Al ethnic Albanians waited to declare their independence after the Serbian presidential election, because the Democrat was um, sort of arranged to win it at the time. I mean, this was this is all related. And then in 2012, they sort of fell flat on their face um, when Vucic was present, had sort of politically reinvented himself. But he, the Serbian political scene has realigned since then because Vucic is now claiming to be this liberal progressive whatever and you know you you've got these out, you know outwardly patriotic parties that are for you know dropping the eu altogether disavowing nato altogether you know entering some sort of union alliance with russia overtly and they're generally getting terrible results in elections because you know vucic just sort of sucked the air out of the room mm -hmm. and and things are polarized between him and these you know fringe euro liberal you know grant eaters um and again you know the grant eaters are sort of doing Vucic's job for him by galvanizing the public into saying well you know we, we got to vote for whoever is not these guys um now i don't think they're the controlled opposition uh, but they certainly play the part mm -hmm. and they they earnestly want to get into power it's just that they're they're 
mindset is so twisted from being in their own media echo chamber that they cannot conceive how to reach out to the electorate. And moreover, they hate the electorate. They despise exactly. the electorate. Yes. They they disdain the people that they want to rule over. And they... They want thank... someone to hand them dictatorial power over this Absolutely. crowd that they hate. Yeah, right, right. They want the EU to... You know, they want the Germans to come in and set them up in power and, you know, back them up with troops, just like they did back in 1941, I guess. Right, right. And it's, it's, it's one of those sentiments. And then they wonder why they can't get enough votes. I mean, mm. from my perspective, you're getting too many already. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but well, can we speak a little bit, uh, very briefly, about those leading figures of this kind of opposition? I mean, opposition to Vucic, opposition to the nationalistic pa slash patriotic uh, forces that uh, you mentioned here. Uh, this opposition that is financed by the EU and that is behind the events uh, at the end of the last year and other events, of course. Can you tell me a, a few words literally about the leading figures and if they have any achievements that they can base themselves on? Because, you know, in Bulgaria, for example, again, let's use this country as a point of, of comparison, because, you know, those leaders of this civic civil society, you know, leaders of this uh, opposition groups that, well, now they're in power, really, so they're not opposition anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, those pro-Western, obsessively, pro-Western people, then they don't really have any leaders that can come up with any sort of achievements that we've achieved this in politics, or we've achieved that in academia, or we've achieved this in whatever other field. But they are, you know, bloggers, or they are anti-corruption activists, whatever it means, you know, this kind of people who have, most of them have not worked seriously one day in their life, and they, they are just now this this uh, flourishing leadership of this, of this sort of pro-Western opposition in Serbia and, and people in power in Bulgaria. So I wonder whether you could just give us a brief overview of the, say, two, three, maybe most uh, important figures in that movement, quote unquote. Well, the most prominent figure on uh, sort of the, you know, the pro-EU um, side is actually an oligarch mm -hmm. and pocket the difference. And he was making millions off of that. And of course, when you know he was no longer in power, suddenly that racket collapsed. Wonder why. Um, and he's been in charge of the most prominent, you know, the biggest party in this in this block. And you have um, these you know younger people that are that style themselves you know eco activists when it's popular. Yeah, can you throw the really name? Can you throw in the um, name? I'd rather I'd rather not discuss rather names not. Okay. because <laughs> great minds discuss ideas and petty minds discuss okay. people. But, um, you know, it, it, people will recognize themselves. All right. Um, but, you know, you've, you've got these younger people who are like eco-activists when it's popular. And then when that idea has been expended, they turn to something else. They turn to like LGBTQ IPP mm. rights and so on and so forth. They basically embrace any pet cause that, that gives them PR. There are, you know, in, in one of the prominent uh, activists that was hawked during these pseudo-Maidan protests um, in December turned out to be like the son of prominent NGO activists. It's like, it, you know, the joke in America that you've had like fifth generation welfare recipients. Well, in Serbia, at this point, you have third generation NGO activists. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. it's like a hereditary industry now. It's almost um, like a family business. Yeah. Democracy right, is a family right. business, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And and if you remember that, that infamous documentary about revolution as a business from like 2011, you realize how ghastly this is because mm. these people are mercenaries. They don't actually believe in any of this stuff. They use their powers of persuasion for, frankly, evil. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you've, and again, the, 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 the pattern is the same. They make these public pronouncements. They pander to a media audience, not to the electorate because they hate the electorate. And then they condemn the people for being, you know, stupid, backwards, toothless yeah. peasants who yeah. who hate democracy and don't deserve to live like every normal person does, which is this mythical concoction yeah. Yeah. created in the 90s. Like, let's let's face it, people who are trying to sell the EU and the US as a model of prosperity now in the year 2024 are idiots. Yeah, that's ludicrous it's, it's, on its face. I mean, <laughs> like 20 years ago, I would understand like, I would understand. I've lived in the U.S. for very many years. I would understand, you know, if, if circa 2003, 2004, before the Iraq invasion and prosperity was still a thing, I would, I get it. But now that, you know, you have documentary evidence, irrefutable evidence of your own eyes and ears that things are bad, both in the U.S. and in Western Europe, 
Like, I'm, I'm sorry, but you, you're either a mercenary or out of your freaking mind. Yeah. Or, or you are ideologically obsessed. And I'm sorry, I, I go back to this notion because it's really, uh, this is, it, it becomes like a medical condition these days. I mean, when you look, when you talk to people in, in many Eastern European countries, you will still see this blind kind of, you know, blind following of, it's not even blind following of the West anymore, but blind following of the imagination that you once had about how things are in the West. And you just don't want to let go because you're afraid so much on a kind of psychological level that the world is going to crumble before you if you just give up this, this idea. Right. Well, I've, I've called this cargo cult democracy. Um, mm. it, basically, there was this back in World War II um, when the US troops were deployed in uh, today's Papua New Guinea fighting the Japanese. They had these airfields where air, you know, airplanes would bring in uh, crates of supplies. And the locals who were technologically disadvantaged, shall we call them, um, decided that the planes are messengers of the gods that magically deliver cargo to the true believers. And the cargo is wealth and power and guns and so forth. And so they built fake airfields out of like sticks and you know whatever local materials were available and they would light beacons and you know call down cargo and the american observers called these the cargo cults of new guinea mm -hmm. these were people who saw something explained it through primitive religion and addressed it accordingly and i'm not insulting eastern european yes, we must launch a holy crusade against russia oh, and yeah. you know oh, yeah. do all this that's... You know, resurrect the polish lithuanian commonwealth and you know, right. go back to the 17th century and it's like what are you people even doing right right that's a question i'm asking myself as well but this is uh, this is yet you know a whole other show where we can discuss yeah. like the meanders of the polish elites thinking about the world and and perceiving itself uh, in this world and in its region, it's like, you know, you have to follow them galaxy after galaxy because it's a very convoluted process. Uh, so I will not delve into that right now because it would take another half an hour, 45 minutes, and we don't have that much time. But let's uh, let's go back for, uh, for a short while to, uh, because we discussed briefly the figures of the opposition against Vucic and this kind of pro-Maidan, pro, you know, obsessively pro-EU opposition uh, that is, um, th that is, you know, uh, that is, part, a minor part of the political process, but still an important part, despite uh, being limited in terms of quantity and, and its impact on the political process in Serbia, it's still a part of it. But let's talk a little bit about Vucic, because people are very confused about this guy. And can you can you give us a brief sort of history? Because you said, you're, you said it yourself, he kind of transitioned at one point. So who is Vucic and is he real? Because, you know, there is this discussion, of course, in social media, is he really, you know, for this kind of brotherhood with Russia? Or is he actually actually a sellout that is going to, you know, hand over at one point, but later on in time, Serbia on a silver plate to the EU and the West. Uh, or is he, is he something, is he someone, uh, something in terms of a political phenomenon, I, I didn't mean to ridicule him, is, is he someone that is not, that we're not able to describe in this one, you know, in this primitive or very simple categories that he's on this side or that side, what is he trying, or is he maybe a seasoned politician that he, that is maneuvering very cleverly? What is, what is your take and what is his history briefly, if you could? Well, um, his history isn't very informative of who he is now. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, he was a, um, um, he rose through the ranks of the radical party in the nineties. Uh, he was, a considered a political apprentice of Wojciech Szczesek, who was, a uh, sort of a very Boris Zhirinovsky type, and it's insulting Zhirinovsky because he's actually uh, um, far more intelligent than people give him credit for. Um, but an, an sort of a you know outspoken, loudmouth nationalist figure and he, who was playing sort of the radical bad cop foil to Slobodan Milosevic. But you're talking about Cheshel now. Yeah, right. I'm talking about Cheshel. Yeah, and, and Vucic sort of rose through the ranks as a junior member of that party, ending up being, uh, ending up as a deputy to Cheshel's successor, Tomislav Nikolic. And then Nikolic, um, he, both of them sort of left the radical party in like 2010, 2011. I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on the exact year. And initially sort of formed this fraction and then rebranded re themselves as the Progressive Party, which, um, as some Serbian historians pointed out, was actually the radical sworn enemy back in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, the, the choice of the of the party may have been accidental or may have been a really, really deep cut. Because during the last um, years of the Abramovich dynasty, which was pro-Austrian, the um, Progressive Party was sort of their pet party in the parliament, the, sort of a bit of a show. And the radicals were the sort of a populist pro karajorjevich faction. And the radicals eventually triumphed. And the progressivists were famously chased down the streets of Belgrade and, and beaten with sticks used to clean the outhouses at the time in an infamous episode. And so the, the proverbial shit stick is um, a, a kind of a Serb folk weapon for political disputes. <laughs> but uh, I know it's, it's a meme. Yeah. But, you know, so to name your party progressive with knowing that history seems like a hint. And yet it seems like it was actually conjured together by a British PR shop that helped create the party back in 2011. And that shop then went out of business because of a scandal in South Africa. So it's questionable whether they're still in control. I would argue they're not anymore. But he sort of positioned himself as, okay, well, you know, clean slate, none of this past history, you know, none of this past matters, uh, you know, turning on, over a new leaf. And the party kicks him out. And, and he's forced to resign. And then he claims that, you know, he's going to run uh, a rival movement that's going to win like, or sweep the election and he wins like less than 1% of the vote and is kicked to the curb. But, you know, th this type of I own the mandate uh, system encourages this kind of fractious behavior. And mm. I'm, I'm convinced at this point it was done on purpose. Right. Right. Well, okay. That's that's uh, that's pretty fascinating. Everything you you know you explain here and um, about Serbian politics and about you know the recent events. Uh, I wonder if we could um, you know circle back for a little while to uh, the question of this Maidan thing that occurred. You know, Maidan, Maidan like you know, uh, Maidan wanna be maybe uh, event of of the last year. I want uh, you to briefly speak about the actual grievances of the Serbian society today, because you described the political scene that there's so much pettiness, that there's so much like emotional hype maybe on individual level, personal kind of personalization of politics, and so on and so forth. For this is a problem that not only Serbia suffers from, of course, uh, but it seems like those problems are more prominent maybe in uh, in, in your country. Uh, but then, you know, I'm sure that, you know, part w w when they get to to the point where they want to organize something like a colored revolution, then they always base part of the idea on the actual real grievances that the society has. And they are trying to, of course, manipulate, you know, large masses of people. Uh, into this movement and uh, and then eventually if many people are in fact involved then eventually this process could be successful and we've seen that by the way you know many many times over we've seen how it played out in Belarus in 2020 if I remember correctly so uh, that was essential right the moment you know you, you probably remember that when they were trying to oh, yeah. activate the, the 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 labor unions right i mean they wanted the labor unions to join and labor unions refused that was i think a pivotal moment for lukashenko and for the armed forces for the you know uh, for, well, not only the armed forces, but the police and the repression apparatus, so to say, not to give up, you know, uh, loyalty to Lukashenko and so on and so forth. I don't want to delve into that. I just brought it up as a kind of reference point. But there were real grievances. I mean, real grievances in terms of like economic hardship and other matters, of course, in the Belarusian society. So I'm thinking that it must have been the same or partially at least the same uh, in uh, in the case of Serbia in December 2023. So I wonder if you could speak about, you know, the actual grievances, the actual social problems and of course, I understand you're not going to be able to go deep into each and every of them. But like, you know, in a, in a kind of superficial, compact manner, if you could just say what are the biggest problems, in your opinion, in your view, uh, in terms of uh, how people in Serbia, you know, live, uh, survive, maybe uh, develop, what are their perspectives, what is how, how things are and what could prompt people out of the problems that they uh, are uh, probably or perhaps uh, facing could prompt them to actually join this kind of protest movement? Well, the, the pseudo Maidanites in December that, stormed, that tried to storm the Belgrade City Hall um, didn't actually harp on social issues at all. Mm. They, they went with the election was stolen narrative um, that seemed cribbed from the 
U.S. Democrats. Yeah, I know, but in the case of Belarus, it was, sorry to interrupt you, right. but in the case of Belarus, it was the same. They also said, oh, the elections were stolen. And, right. and uh, OK, but uh, what is igniting people to sometimes right. join that is some kind of grievances that they have. Right. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons that the, their particular argument fizzled was that they claimed the elections were stolen nationwide, mm -hmm. but they only wanted it revised in Belgrade because that's where they had a theoretical chance of, of getting power and access to funding. Mm -hmm. it's, it's access to tax money that, that's the key because political parties in the Balkans in general subside on um, state patronage. So you need you know, control of utility companies, which are extractive in nature as opposed to serving the populace. You need control of budgets. You, know, you, you, you basically, the, the, whole, um, the whole method of financing is, is from, the state, you know, from state grants. And so whoever gets to control the government gets to control the fisc and extract from it. And, you know, this is why Belgrade has been an obsession of the of everybody, really. But specifically in this instance, the pro-EU groupation um, that, that wanted to seize power in the city because it is the biggest city in Serbia. That's where all the money is, uh, especially in recent years, because um, there is a real grievance. There's a real social grievance uh, by Serbians uh, because they're cost of living has gone up, mm -hmm. partly because of COVID, partly because of the economic crisis in the EU, partly because they've agreed, the government has agreed to jack up the prices of utilities, such as, you know, power specifically, electricity, at the, because the, the IMF and the EU demand it. Well, why should we care? But okay. Um, and so, you know, every society's prosperity rests on cheap energy. And, you know, some people complain that their bills have doubled. That's a lot. Salaries haven't gone up. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've been going around Belgrade for weeks, looking at storefronts, advertising, you know, help wanted, offering salaries and benefits, and nobody wants to work because, because the, the amount that they're willing to pay people is not enough to cover the ever rising expenses. And it's just one of those baffling examples of how distorted the economies have become from the lockdown. And Serbia has had pretty mild ones, but they still, you know. During, uh, I believe, right after COVID, there was this whole thing of, you know, oh, there's some kind of cattle plague or swine plague. We must kill all the pigs. And Serbia decimated its, its uh, pig farming industry. And as a result, the prices of meat have gone up. Sure. And, and so you've, you've got prices of food going up. You've got, you know, and a lot of it is being imported from the EU because the, uh, the, the meat production and uh, processing has sort of been wildly privatized and sold off to Westerners. And again, like Serbia is a big agricultural country. It's a, it has magnificent food production, but a lot of the stuff you see on the shelves is, you know, literally yesterday I got a thing of kefir that was, you know, Russian branded, but in Romanian. And it turns out it's produced by Germans exported to Moldova and then sent back to Serbia by a third party. Lord knows how much they're making in arbitrage. You know, this is the kind of thing that you, you've got shelves full, but at what cost? Mm -hmm. And and what is what is that doing to domestic manufacturers? That sort of thing. I don't want to get into the, the, the detail, you know, pedestrian details of economics to bore people to tears, but these are important things. And the biggest problem that people here complain that I've heard people voice is that, you know, the salaries are not enough to live on because everything has gotten much more expensive. And one of the big factors in this is the arrival of all of these foreigners, specifically Russians and Ukrainians, mm -hmm. both dis, you know dissidents or refugees from the war, because there's a lot of Ukrainians who fled mobilization, and there's a lot of Russians who disagreed with the government and fled here, also fearing they would be drafted. And then there's people who came voluntarily so they could continue working in the IT sector and sort of you know not be targeted by Western sanctions. Well, for, for which, whichever reason they showed up, you know, they were able to bring in a lot. Some of them were able to bring in a lot of money with them. Mm -hmm. And whenever that happens, it, it just distorts the market significantly. And they're sort of pricing the locals out. Yesterday, I was reading a comparison of rents in, in Europe and in Balkans capitals. And they were saying that Sarajevo, which is in Bosnia, is far cheaper because the city has, you know, basically come to rely on tourism a lot of the locals have sold off properties and so a lot of them are unrented and just sitting abandoned and they're willing to drop the rents in order to cover them again not to get into details but like belgrade is full 
there's a lot of there's a lot of real estate. The real estate balloon has been really inflated over the last couple of years, and people can't afford rent unless you know unless they've been grandfathered in. If if you're actually just moving to Belgrade, you can't afford it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so again, like these are the things that you know things that the markets are expensive relative to the to the local income. You, you gotta you gotta calculate by purchasing power parity. You can't just say, oh well this is cheaper than in Berlin or sure. more expensive than in Washington. To you know, not to not to rag on Tucker Carlson going into a Russian supermarket, <laughs> but you know, I think his point was that, you know, it's it's clean and people return to shopping carts and nothing's locked up because of thieves, which all of which are true. Um and nothing is locked up in Belgrade either. Yeah, or in but, Warsaw for that matter, or right. you know in Sofia. Yeah. So yeah right. I, I, but but that's normal. That's expected. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it, it, you, know you, you can't expect people in Serbia to be grateful that, you know, their supermarkets don't lock up uh, toothbrushes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, no, that's absolutely. normal. That's, yeah. That, yeah. You shouldn't have to. So you, you can't say, well, you know, but there are cities in America that are that are you know collapsing into savagery. Well, OK, but what's it to me? Mm. You know, I need to pay my bills at the end of this month. Yeah, of course, and, that's, of course. That's a, and that's a legitimate grievance of a lot of people. The problem is that the opposition, neither neither the opposition nor, I mean, the government is like, well, the solution is to dig up half of Serbia for lithium and sell it to the EU. Um, no, actually, it isn't. Uh, but, you know, and the opposition is like, uh, we need to sell twice as much lithium to the EU and also give up Kosovo and and and, you know, give us power to reprogram the toothless peasants that are terrible and that don't deserve (laughs) our benevolent rule. And I'm like, you people are idiots. And thank God that you're idiots because you'll never get in power this way. And, you know, nobody really seems to care about, you know, the ordinary people on the shelves, uh, whether through government subsidies or debt or whatever. Mm -hmm. But he actually, you know, he spoke about these issues that people care about that directly affect their daily lives. And are probably more important than the historical kind of, you know, uh, ideas that you might have on the basis of all kinds of things um, that you mentioned are also very often floated in politics as some kind of viable reference points. So yeah, look, for the end, uh, because uh, we got to wrap it up here, we've spoken for over one hour, which, you know, I want to thank you again for taking the time to explain all those things in detail. That's 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 a fascinating, um, fascinating journey into the uh, political reality in Serbia today. Uh, I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, the question of you know the uh, attitude and um, relations between Russia and Serbia because you know there's a lot of talk and especially in Poland when you turn on the mainstream media which I don't do often out of hygiene but w- when you turn them on then you will hear uh, you know if the question of Serbia comes up, then it's always, oh my God, it's Russian colonized. The Russians are everywhere there. They control everyone. They pull the strings and all the rest of it, you know. And uh, of course, I understand and most of our viewers, I'm sure, are aware that it's not the case. Uh, But on the other hand, we have to ask ourselves the following question. You know, there is this, I call it, I like to call it the orthodox bow. Uh, When you look Eastern Europe, you know, then of course there's Russia. Then there's Belarus, Ukraine until some time ago, Moldova, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, you know, maybe Montenegro, I don't know, maybe some other post-Yugoslav republics and Greece even to to a certain extent, where you can see that there is a favorable brotherly attitude among the public, not among the political classes, but among the public towards Russia. And, you know, of course, this is being despised, like in many, uh, you know, in Western countries and also in our countries as well, by these marginal people uh, who hate the history and the kind of culture that we've developed uh, in these in these regions. So, uh, you know, we have this and I wonder whether, uh, you know, you you feel that Russia is even thinking of exploiting it in any way. Because, you know, my observation is uh, exploiting it in terms of like, you know, geopolitical leverage or some kind of political strategies. And please don't get me wrong. I'm not calling for for Russia to colonize uh, those countries. I'm just thinking because, you know, I don't see that. I mean, I don't see, I've heard about this Russian influence in Serbia, Russian influence in Bulgaria. Everything is controlled by Russians there. And somehow, you know, I consider myself to be a rather careful observer of what, what things are like and have been like in Bulgaria for the last decades. And I've really seen so little Russian influence, so little that it barely, you know, it's barely visible in terms of 
you know, Russia's political investment into the political process in Bulgaria or, you know, in other countries. And I wonder whether you see that the same way, first of all. And second, mm, whether you feel that there is any kind of Russian influence in Serbia, for example, and whether it is wisely managed from the point of view of, you know, Russian interests, whatever they might be or however you might want to define them in Serbia. Because, you know, again, I, I, I was looking deliberately for it in many areas in Eastern Europe. And of course, Belarus is a, is, is a separate story, obviously. Uh, and Ukraine today is a separate story as well. But, you know, when it comes to, well, the Balkans, our area, right? When obviously the Bulgarian nation, the Serbian nation, other nations probably as well, but those two especially, they obviously clearly demonstrate they stand with Russia however they understand it or not understand sometimes but you know Russia doesn't seem to be really much interested in taking any kind of advantage from Russia's attitude seems to me to be like look guys if you work it out the way that you want to work with us afterwards and you want to align with us somehow that's your business if you don't do that or if you don't have enough strength to do that if you allow the west to dominate you it's your problem we don't care anymore this is how i see it what's what's your take um i think you're spot on actually this is this is probably a perfect summary of russian policy um i don't have it i, I don't have any like direct sources of information on russian policy this is only speculation based on you know the effects of it but no, what I you can see what is available in the right, public yeah. right what is strictly observable is that moscow does not do soft power the way washington does mm. um one of the things the us has been really good at for decades is propaganda and not just any propaganda but uh, the kind of you know seductive consumerist you know showing people the american dream type of thing that has had a side effect in recent years of drawing millions of migrants from all over the world across the US Mexico border even though America isn't like that and hasn't been for quite some time but you know they, they keep selling the dream to people through these you know through ads through TV shows through movies um whereas Russians don't necessarily do that um their movies especially the state subsidized ones do have political and cultural messages but they've seen mostly targeting the home audience and not necessarily international audiences. I think the farthest they've gone in, in sort of any sort of cultural outreach to Serbia has been the Balkan, the Balkan line, mm -hmm. the movie about the 99 Kosovo war a few, from a few years back, which was great. Don't get me wrong. But like, that was the extent of that. Um, the, the Russian, inf you know, the Russian influence in Serbia is mostly cultural in, in, so, you know, there's concerts, there's, you know, uh, no, you're lucky you still have that in Poland, for example. Right, in the right. East. <laughs> I mean, yeah, in, in the West has been has been cancelled, but you know, and and you have, ironically, because of all of these migrants, you have some culinary influences, and you know, uh, you, you get, you know, you can find kvass in stores mm -hmm. now, which you weren't able to until a, a few years back. You know, some some Russian foods and specialties, and you know, there was a Georgian restaurant that I just saw the other day in Belgrade, which was highly unusual, but. Again, there's no like Moscow doesn't have a policy of influence that I can see. Yeah, yeah. Unlike unlike Washington, unlike Brussels. Now, their attempts at cultural hegemony are often ham fisted and counterproductive, but the Russian one seems non existent. Mm -hmm. And so I basically I would argue, I would go so far as to argue that most Russian influence in the Balkans, in Serbia specifically, is a phantom menace conjured by these, you know, Western grant eaters who yeah. need an enemy and exactly. who have to and who have to invent this, you know, yeah, they're making it up menace. all the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In order to justify, oh, you know, give me more money, Friedrich Heber Stiftung or Soros yeah. or whatever. And, you know, it's it's and it's I also, I, I, I think it's also the, the, this element that they just cannot quite comprehend that people might think differently than in France or America, you know, I mean, because they well, think like Fran in, in France in America. Right, right. Yeah. and it's also projection because, yeah. you know, because they're the cultists who worship the West due to Western influence. Therefore, there must be 
you know, everybody Something nefarious who, about the other person, yeah. So it's right, Russian influence, probably, because otherwise... Right, therefore, they, anybody they, who they, likes they, Moscow has to be, a, you know, yeah. has to be propagandized. It's, it's, it's confession through projection. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, very well said. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Nebojša, on that note, I want to wrap up uh, today's video. Thank you very much. It was really very interesting. And uh, I hope to see you again on our program. I would like, I would love to discuss, especially that you revealed while we were talking here that you're a historian. So I want to, I, I want to use this uh, as, as a kind of advantage to uh, perhaps discuss uh, a little bit the, the history of the of pulling Yugoslavia apart because that's that that's also a very kind of mythologized thing in the European historiography and it against um, this sort of idea that people who live in Eastern Europe are somehow you know not not humanistic not human enough not 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 politically wise enough to organize their own countries and their own nations and their own cultures and they always have to you know fight together and so on and so forth and i'd love to discuss this and i'd love to discuss 1999 of course and the lead up to 1999 this is also something completely falsified in main in the mainstream and that's something that we'd love to uh, to have you on to sort of discuss if um if and when you uh, uh, you have you happen to have a little bit of time to share with us and uh, to our viewers and listeners i want to encourage you to please check out our substack account where you can get a regular newsletter so don't miss out on anything it's the barricade.substack.com and also you can visit our telegram channel it's very easy to find you just type in the barricade in uh, the search uh, search engine so to say in telegram and you can um, you can find it and also last but not least please visit our patreon account patreon.com slash the barricade where you can support us financially if you like our productions thank you very much Nebojša, and thank you very much to all the people watching and listening to our show see you in the next segments mm -hmm.